Ryan, the most interesting idea that I heard today was from Chris Hayes, who is a very interesting chap, and he has this whole theory of fractal inequality in the world and in countries and even in Davos. And in fact, over at Reuters.com, the fabulous uh, Anya Schifrin wrote a blog entry um, called Jealous, Jealous Davos Mistresses. But never mind the Jealous Davos Mistresses. What she wrote is that the genius of the World Economic Forum is that it, quote, is that Klaus Schwab has, quote, been able to persuade hundreds of accomplished businessmen to pay thousands of dollars to an attend an event which is largely based on mass humiliation and paranoia. Basically, everyone thinks that the most interesting parties are somewhere else. Everyone wants the next level up of badge, color, you know, we have different colored badges. And everyone is full of trying to work out um, who they're more important than, who's more important than them, and is very, very afraid that, you know, there's some great party going on somewhere which they don't know about. But this is a microcosm of the world, right? So if you look at the world as a whole, then 80% of the world population lives in a way that we would probably consider absolutely unlivable and destitute. But, you know, we don't consider ourselves particularly lucky in relation to them because we're just looking up at the 20% above us and saying, ooh, we want to be even more... And you, um, see, this, yeah. you, you see this at every, at every point at which you zoom in to the, to, to the distribution, right? I mean, as you noted, this is just the, the nature of exponential increase. But, but it's, it's certainly true in the U.S. context in which you, you zoom in to the top 20%. In fact, the politics of class resentment in the U.S. are actually structured around this to a large degree because much of the politics that we've seen both, on both sides of the political, the political spectrum, the left and the right, Tea Party and Move On, for instance, are really upper middle class revolts. They're upper middle class revolts that are channeling class resentment at an elite that is sort of detaching itself from the rest of that top 20%. And then you zoom in again at, at Davos, you know, you, I, you zoom into that top that top 1% and you see the same sort of distributional effects are happening in that top 1%. So it, it sort of reinscribes itself. And even the within the top 0.1%, right. they still feel this way. They, right. they, they, they never become secure in their plutocratic status. They always feel that someone else, you know, the Chinese have managed to go to go. Well, I think actually it produces certain kind of psychological problems. And I think it actually, one of the things that you see um, in, in the, there was a profile, Roger Hills, um, who's, who's a, a plutocrat in good standing and sort of proud of it, um, uh, who's the head of Fox News, of course. Um, sorry, Roger. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically, what, it showed that this, here's a guy who really views himself as a sort of middle class, class work, populist. And it, it makes you realize that the, 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 the nature of this kind of fractal inequality creates a psychological disposition in which you have an overclass of people convinced that they are scrappy underdogs. Now, one of my sort of big picture views of the world has always been that what we're seeing um, is increasing inequality within countries, yeah. especially if you look at the number of billionaires who have been created in places like Mexico, China, India, increasing inequality within countries, but decreasing inequality between countries. Yeah. So the, the difference between the US and China has never been smaller. Well, I mean, not since about 1300 or something. So, um, <laughs> That's true, actually, it hasn't been smaller. <laughs> but, but, you know, so, so is there somewhere in this exponential graph, is, is the fact that the countries of the world are coming together? Um, maybe the sort of silver lining to this, and uh, you know, even though we're seeing this global international plutocratic elite, that somehow, because all countries are like that, and we're all in the same boat, that somehow that's going to help in improve the sort of international solidarity well, of the working man, I have no idea. Well, that would be great, but I mean, I think what the, what, what's, what's, I guess what's worrisome from my perspective is that you see, you, you, don't, you don't want to see a convergence towards plutocracy. What you want to see is a, you want to see a convergence towards, a, from my perspective, a sustainable, uh, just, equitable, humane, social democratic order. <laughs> and so, and so the question is whether that is the, the place to which things are converging. I think one of the places to look at one of the places that I think is a really interesting thing about that is in the context of China, because there really is this real outstanding question about constant China, distinct from the question of political liberty, democratic <laughs> governance, the question of what kind of social welfare state is China going to create? Um, and they make noises about it increasingly, and there are small things at the margins they do around healthcare and, 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 
new pensions. But um, we really want to hope that the increased prosperity that we've seen in China will both lift people out of poverty, uh, poverty as it has and will continue to do, but that's combined with some real kind of um, robust improvements in the social contract. So there you go. It, there, are there, there are hopes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, and, and thank you for your question, Brian. And um, I hope we've utterly failed to answer your question. Cheers.